you were here last night as well, and so it's great to be back here again this morning. You know, this week I was talking to one of our sisters who just had surgery, and she quoted a verse to me that God has just been uh, working in her as she goes through a time of a little bit of difficulty, a little bit of suffering. So I want to start our service this morning with this verse from 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. And it says, and after you have suffered... A little while. So she was about 10, she's about 10 days out from surgery when I was talking to her. She said, after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. And, and that's our God, isn't it? We go through a little bit of suffering. It's just a little while, but then he restores us. He's the one who brings us through, who sees us through to victory. And uh, so we want to sing our praises to him this morning. We want to lift his name. And I would like us to stand together and sing our first song, He is the one who is holy forever. And so to him be all glory and power and dominion. Uh, let's worship him this morning. thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name
Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we give you praise this morning that you are the Holy One, that though we do suffer for a short time on this earth, we, we go through difficulties. You are the one who brings restoration. You're the one who strengthens us, who brings healing, who, who is to be exalted because you are the Almighty God. And so we give you glory this morning, Lord, that you are at work. No matter the situation, while we're in the middle of the suffering, you are at work. And so this morning, Lord, we pray for those who are suffering, those who are facing the battle, the storm this morning. We pray for Bella as she is recovering for surgery. And Lord, you've put a peace in her heart and a joy that you're working in her. I pray you'd continue to bring restoration. Lord, we pray for Jim, who's home today, not able to be with us because of uh, cancer and the pain in his body is, is hard to bear. Certain days he struggles and yesterday was a really bad day for him. And so, Father, we just pray that today he would sense your strength. He would sense your touch upon him. Lord, for others who we know are experiencing difficulty and sickness, we ask that you would bring uh, strength and health to them. Many weren't able to be here last night because of sickness. And so we ask your touch upon them. Lord, you know each person's situation and the, the battles that they're facing. And so we ask that uh, even as we celebrate the, uh, the death and resurrection of Christ this morning, as we partake together in the Lord's Supper, Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts and lives and that we would know that you are able and you are doing something even when we can't see it. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seating. Be seated. We are going to prepare our hearts for communion at this time. The ushers are going to come as uh, we prepare. So if you're online, you'll want to make sure that you are able to get your stuff uh, together, your emblems. We will partake together. I just want you all to know that we welcome open communion. That is, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you don't need to be a member of our church family in order to partake of communion. Um, but we will be... Um, Holding all the emblems after we get them, Pastor Jonathan will come and do a devotion, and then we will partake together. Ushers, come forward, and as they come and uh, distribute the communion, we will sing Cornerstone. Christ is our cornerstone. Let's just worship him this morning.
is Lord of all this morning. Uh, and at communion, we're supposed to remember that, that he is the Lord of all. That if you're going through a difficult time, just realize that he is bringing all things together for good. That he is putting all things, God the Father is putting all things under the feet of Jesus. Even now, he's at work doing this. Um, I'm, I'm reflecting on um, a, a pa different passages that I could choose for today's message. And I went back to Romans. We finished Romans last time. And it would be a shame to celebrate communion without going to Romans. Uh, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 5, verse 17 this morning as our, 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 our text. Uh, verse five, uh, chapter 5, 17 says, For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive it receive sorry, the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. This is an incredible verse that, first of all, reminds us that because of sin entering the world, death reigned through all. Death entered into the picture, not God's intention. But that's what, what happened. All of us experienced death. But when Jesus came, he, one of the things that he desired and one of the things he, d he did was to destroy death, to abolish death, and it's, it's reign over, over people. And if you will receive, if, and if you have received the gift of life found in Jesus Christ, death no longer has a hold on you. And so when Jesus says to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, the one who believes in me will never die. And even if he dies, because he believes in me, he will live. It's an awesome expression of, of how when we believe in Jesus, we enter into the resurrection of life. And actually, death now, we don't, it doesn't hold fear for us. We don't be, aren't to be afraid of death because it's actually passing from this life into the next. So whether we live or we die, we're with the Lord. We are the Lord's, and we, we live to please him. So, but there is coming a day. And that is an awesome, the awesome hope, too, where death will be totally done away with. It will cease to have any power, any authority over anyone. And so we look forward to that day, and that brings us to our, our communion text. From beginning to end, it's about what Christ has, has done. But just to remind you in, in uh, Romans 5.17, that this comes to those who receive the abundance of grace that is more than enough, grace that meets all of your needs, grace that carries you through the day, grace that helps you in whatever way we need it, he's there for us. He's our friend, he's our comforter, he's our, our wisdom from God, he's our, he's our helper in every, in every and any situation. You know, God wants to be a part of our lives in, every, in everything. And then it goes on, the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness uh, that are found in him. And so just to read those two things, grace, abundance of grace, and righteousness, right relationship with him. Really, I tell you, church, that's all we need. You have his abundance. You have his righteousness. That means you're, you're right with God. He's making you right with others. What more could you possibly need in life than his grace and his righteousness? And they're given to us as a free gift. For us. Let's read our communion text this morning, um, and we're thinking about what Jesus has done for us, uh, and it is, it's all about grace, it's all about righteousness. So verse 23, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he took it, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the drink together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that is where life in this world is found, is found in Christ, receiving what he's done for us, walking with him now every day. Righteousness is not simply about doing the right thing, it's being right. It's being in right relationship with, with God. What a difference that makes. Let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you 
for the incredible plan of salvation in which you desire to show your incredible mercy and your love for people. And you, through Jesus, through him taking our sin upon himself, you would extend grace to everyone, forgiveness of sins, and also bringing us into right relationship with, with you. And Lord, if you are for us, what does it matter who's against us? If you are for us, we know you hold us and will bring us through every trouble and every difficulty. And if you are for us and you actually are pouring out your grace into our hearts and lives, we have what we need. And so God, I pray for those who are suffering this morning, they will receive a touch from you, a healing touch, a comfort touch, uh, a presence, a, a touch of your presence, that, Lord, they know they're not alone, but we have you with us, and you are working. And, God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for your incredible work of salvation. And, Jesus, you continue to reign at the right hand of God, pouring out grace, pouring out your spirit upon all who need it. So, Lord, let us receive it today. Let us be marked as those who have received your abundant grace and righteousness and reign in this life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. All right, well, we have a couple announcements. First, I want to start by saying a huge thank you to everyone who participated to make yesterday an awesome night. I think everybody who was there enjoyed their time together. And uh, so what a team it was who came together to do the cooking and the, the cleaning and all the setup. So I just want to offer our thanks for that. Secondly, you may have noticed we had some people out taking pictures. We had a little photo op place over here yesterday, and, and some of our team are taking pictures. We are trying to become a little bit more active on our social media sites. So I want you to know if you don't want your face posted on there at all, please let us know. We will respect that. Uh, we'll just do sides or put something else on. But uh, otherwise, we will try to start posting a little bit more on our social media. So uh, if you're uncomfortable with that, please let us know. Text or email me or chat with me as well. Uh, also, to, to more, today there's a young adult lunch right after the service. Young adults are having lunch and devotion, so they'll eat some more. I tell you, you didn't get enough last night, you get some more food today. And then tomorrow, the ball drops. I, it is time of a day of prayer and fasting. So if you can't fast food, you can fast TV, you can fast something that will, is taking place in your life where you could devote that time to God. And so uh, you can do it from wherever you are. You can give up whatever you want. But as a church, if all of us choose to fast even one meal or choose to do something and we spend that time focused on God, we know that revival happens through prayer. And so we want to all be praying together. Tomorrow is the special day of prayer and fasting. Uh, Tuesday is our ladies' Bible study, and Tuesday they are packing uh, special baskets for those that aren't able to get out, and uh, so we want to make sure ladies are aware of that. And then Wednesday is our Bible study. This is our second to last Bible study. We have one more week after this, so uh, we trust you'll be able to come out and enjoy that. Thursday, if you are 55 and up, you get to come and eat again. 11.30 to 1, I believe it is, seniors are coming to have their Season Saints potluck. And so you'll want to put that on. And then Thursday evening, the choir and drama are practicing because next Sunday is our Christmas musical. And uh, so I trust you'll all be able to come for that. It's going to be a great time. This Friday, the youth are looking for missing persons. So youth, please note that you need to be here at 6. You guys need a little more time because you're hunting for people. It takes a little bit extra time. You've got to get to a mall. So uh, you want to make sure you're able to be here at 6 o'clock. And then Saturday, if you haven't eaten enough this week, men's breakfast. Breakfast. I tell you that there's a consistent theme here. We like to eat together. I think Jesus set that example though, right? So we're in good company. So men come out to breakfast Saturday morning at 9 a.m. And at this time, I'm going to ask Moffitt to come and uh, just uh, share for a few minutes before we take the offering. Morning, church. Uh, once again, we'd like to for the month of December, we appreciate uh, the good work of our pastors, what they do for us. Uh, they do wonders for this church. Uh, one example, the kitchen, the towels, they were put up by our pastor, uh, pastoral team. Uh, have you ever seen a pastor shovel snow in any other church? They do it here. Have you ever seen a pastor go in a ladder in, other, in another church? 
they do it here. They paint the walls, they shovel snow, they do the walls. They do everything for us. They even give us the good news every Sunday. They even planned it for three years. We praise them for that. Let us show them our love by doing a financial offering for them uh, through our envelopes where it says other, we mark love, and then we put the amount there. This is above our tithes and offering. And then on the website where it says donate, uh, we put our tithe number there, we write love, and then we put the amount there. And then uh, also we put our tithe numbers because we get uh, a tax receipt. So let's do that. And the government, I love Canada. You give, they give you your money back. Part of it. So let's do that for our pastors, please. Let's show love for our pastors. Thank you. Thank you, Moffat. You may have missed your calling in marketing. I think that was a commercial there. <laughs> All right. At this time, we're going to call our ushers forward to receive our tithes and offerings this morning. And... Uh, it is a privilege to be able to give unto the Lord. It's a privilege to be able to receive and to see that God is at work in, in the hearts and lives of those around us. So I'm going to ask Doreen, would you pray a blessing on the offering this morning? Amen. God bless you as you give. While the offertory is playing, I believe there will be a little video clip on the screen of the youth. Don't you just wish you could be a youth again? <laughs> I tell you, I never told anybody what we used to do in the sanctuary over at Cornerstone. <laughs> I would have been in huge trouble. When my wife was in charge of youth, I said, no, we can't do that in the church. She says, watch me. <laughs> and it was a good time for all the kids. It was wonderful. Thank you for sharing uh, what happens in the youth group. That sounds, it looks great. You know, we're in this Christmas season. And I uh, saw the lights today, and I've just been really noticing a lot of people are thinking an awful lot about what Christmas is really all about. And um, when we look at the babe in the manger, we recognize God's greatest gift to us, his precious son. And then we look 33 years later down the calendar, which isn't that long. Not when I look back at my life, 33 years ago just seems like, few days ago and we think of Jesus dying on a cross and we see him there his life is being poured out for us and we have such a beautiful gift 
the gift of his life that he gave to us. It's beautiful, it's, there's beauty in that little manger, in the dust, and the smell of the stable. But there is so much beauty at the cross. And I'd like you to stand together with me and sing this hymn that's one of my favorites. We've sung it here before. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood of Jesus, a power to set us free, power to wash our sins away, to bring forgiveness. So let's rejoice in the Lord in what he has done for us. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you arrive all a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power. It's in the blood. All of the Lamb, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, there is power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. Sing it now. There is power. in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Praise God. Turn to somebody that's standing beside you and said, there's power in Jesus. Do that right now. You tell them because you've experienced the power of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> oh. Let's continue to sing together. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the Father Praise the Son Praise the Spirit Three in one God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Yes, Lord. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for your sake you died. Praise the Father, oh praise the Son, praise the Spirit, yes, Lord. Oh, God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. That stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the 
dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored and the church of Christ was born then the Spirit lit the flame yes now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Oh, praise his name. Praise the Father. Oh, praise. Hallelujah. Bless your holy name, Jesus. We invite you to come for prayer. If there is a need that you have, body, soul, spirit, emotions, you just need the care of our Lord Jesus. You need his touch today. As you can see, we have people that will pray with you. And they, together with your faith, because we come with faith, right? We trust that God is going to meet us as we pray together. Something good will happen because the Lord is here to minister to you. Sing it again as you come. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit. Three in one. God. forever to the King of Kings. Yes, we praise you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Every creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear cries praise you Jesus bless you Lord where the whole earth echoing his eminence his name what burst from sea and sky from rivers to the mountain tops we'd hear Christ be magnified oh Christ be magnified let his praise arise Christ be 
magnify from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. When every creature finds its inmost melody and every human heart its native cry then in one enraptured hymn of praise we'll sing Christ be magnified oh altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me, in me, Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death. Many times I've wondered at your gift of love, and I'm in that place once again. I'm in that place once again. And once again I look upon the cross where you died. Humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I pour out my life. Thank you, Jesus. Now you are exalted to the highest place of the heaven where one day I'll bow but for now I marvel at this saving grace and I'm full of praise once again oh yes Lord I'm full of praise once again and once again I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I pour out my love. And once again I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I pour out my life. Mm, yes, Jesus. Thank you. I thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. Oh, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. That again. I thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. 
Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. We thank you, Lord, today for dying on the cross for us, for making the way open and free for each one of us to come and bow our knee and say, I will serve you, Jesus. Please forgive me. Please wash me. Please change me. Give me a hope. Give me freedom. Give me life. And someday, Lord, I want to be home with you. All through the days, all through the journey, you will walk with me. But someday, I want to walk with you in heaven above. Thank you for going to the cross. Thank you for coming in such a humble way to that manger bed. Thank you that you walk with us every single day. You have never failed us. You have always been there. Gentle shepherd, if there's one here today that needs that extra help, pick them up, Lord. Carry them along until they once more can set their feet down to walk with you. Thank you for this in Jesus' name and bless your word together, we pray in all of our hearts. Amen. You may be seated together. Pastor Naomi is coming to share with us. All right. Am I on? There we go. Well, it's great to be able to share with you again this morning. Um, we've been going through our Wonder of the Word sermon series, and uh, last night as Andre was speaking, I just really appreciated how he brought in our series and going through these people of the genealogy. And I have to admit, I am not one who just loves reading genealogies. I have a daughter who enjoys that. Myself, I'm like, I'll just read the name. I, I don't need who begat, who begat, who begat. You know, I'm like, um, I'll just read the names quickly. But you know, it's really exciting is as you're studying these Old Testament passages, the names are not just a name anymore. You get to know the character, the person, the, the ways that they've experienced a relationship with God and how God has become real to them. And as Andre was pointing out, those who are part of that lineage of Christ who are not perfect people, he pointed out those who are from different, different nationalities, those who are flawed, those who have lived in sin and done different things that have not been righteous the whole time. But God, God is the one who makes the, makes the way. God is the one who chooses whom he will use. And God is the one who makes us righteous. God is the one who brought people into the line of Jesus, of, of Jesus, even those who we would have said weren't righteous enough to be considered an ancestor of Christ. So today, as we are continuing our sermon series, we've completed Romans and we're heading into Judges. We're looking at Judges chapter 1, verses 1, to chapter 3, verse 6. And we concluded Joshua a little while back. And at the end of Joshua, Joshua himself had passed away and been buried. Now, Judges continues the story very it's very natural. It says in Judges 1 verse 1, after the death of Joshua, the people of Israel inquired of the Lord, who shall go up for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? Though Joshua had passed away, his righteousness is evident still upon the people. The very first thing they do, they inquire of the Lord. Like we're all like, yes, they got it right. Well, they didn't get it right for very long. You know, like they're saying, who's going to lead us? Joshua's death signaled the end of a time when there was a centralized leader. Moses and then Joshua both led the whole tribe, all the Israelite tribes. But now at Joshua's death comes, they have been put into their own lands, the portion of land that they are going to get. And now the tribes are going to live more distinct, settling in their own portion of the land. But they're expected to cooperate together under the leadership of God himself. And as we read this first verse of Judges, we're thinking they're doing pretty good. They're, they're seeking God for his counsel. But as I noted, it doesn't last very long. In this chapter, in the book of, Jud of Judges, there are actually two introductions. 
And when Pastor Jonathan finishes the book, you'll find that there are actually two conclusions as well. So the intro to Judges first begins with Judges 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 5. We already looked at Judges 1, verse 1. Joshua was buried. He was dead. People were now looking for a new leader. But if you come to Judges 2, verse 6, that's the beginning of a second introduction, and Joshua is still alive, actually. In Judges 2, verse 6 to 8, it says, When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. So we, we know at the beginning they're seeking the Lord, and then we come to the second introduction. We again see that while Joshua's influence is still upon them, they are seeking the Lord. But as I said, it doesn't last long. That was Judges 2, verse, verse 8. Well, it's only a couple verses down. In Judges 2, verse 10, it says... And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. You know something's coming when this generation comes up who doesn't know the Lord, who doesn't know what he has done. That might remind you of another time in history, another time in the Bible, not too long ago, when we heard of somebody, a new ruler was raised up who did not know the works of Joseph. Do you remember that? In, in um, Exodus 1 verse 8, it says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And if you remember with me what happened at that time, when a new leader arose, he didn't understand that Joseph had helped deliver them. Joseph was the one who had brought them through slavery. The Israelites were welcomed in Egypt. But when a new leader came up, all of a sudden, he forgot all about that past. And the, the Egyptians started to be fearful that the Israelites were going to overtake them. And so they enslaved the Israelites. Because the new leader didn't know that the Israelites were important in the Egyptian history in saving them from famine. And so that's what happened to the Israelites in an earlier time when a king forgot about what they had done. But now the Israelites themselves... This new generation rises up, and they forget all about what God has done. And so in a very similar way, they experience that, uh, that wandering away, that infidelity, because they don't hold to what was history. They don't hold to what happened in recognizing that God provides for them. God is the one who delivered them. So we realize it's important to pass on the stories. The Israelites were supposed to have been ones who told the stories to the next generation. Hey, God is faithful. He delivered us from the Egyptians. He brought us through the wilderness. God is faithful. We have this amazing relationship with God. Always rely on God. Well, they kind of forgot to pass that on. However... God is still faithful. Time and time again, though the Israelites fail, though Is that better? Am I on? We'll give it a try. There we go. All right. So the Israelites forgot all about how God was faithful to them, but God is still merciful even when we are unfaithful. Even though they didn't tell their history to their kids, even though they didn't pass it on, God is still merciful. And though the children of Israel fail time and time again, God offers mercy. As it says in Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. God is merciful and slow to anger. But don't think that means he's complacent about sin. 
There is a time of judgment for those who don't walk in his ways. And James 2 verse 13 says, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Did you get that? Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. But I like this. Mercy triumphs over judgment. But to the one who shows no mercy, to the one who chooses not to walk with the Lord, judgment is assured. God is slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. But as we concluded the book of Joshua, we saw that as his blessings are assured and you can know, if God promises you a blessing, you can know he's going to hold to it. But you can also know that if he promises you that if you walk away, there will be judgment, that he will guarantee that judgment as well. He demands our commitment. And Joshua declared in Joshua 23, verse 4, 15 and 16, but just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off the good of this land that the Lord your God has given you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given you. God is so faithful to fulfill both the good and the judgment that he has promised. So we need to walk in righteousness because if we don't, his judgment will be necessary. We see a cycle in the children of Israel and how they lived. And I'm going to have a picture on the screen, I believe, if we can get it up there. This is a picture of the cycle of the children of Israel. And it's kind of a cycle for many people. We start in the left, top left, the yellow, an area of disobedience the children of Israel I think they camped in this place quite a while and then God brings discipline and then God sends deliverance and it's great if you can walk in a place of deliverance and and stay there for a while but sadly we see the children of Israel immediately go back to that area of disobedience so as we look at this, we remember Joshua's final speech to the people. He said, choose you this day whom you will serve. And I would say that to us today that we need to choose today how we're going to live, how we're going to respond in the face of temptation. So we don't continually go back into that cycle of disobedience. Faithfulness is essential when confronted with temptation. And that's what I want us to understand today, that we can be faithful, we need to be faithful when confronted with temptation. While God is merciful when we fail, if we don't choose to walk in faithfulness, we will just continue to perpetuate this cycle. And as I prepared for my sermon today, I was wrestling with how to go about this because this process just keeps happening, but sometimes they're in different seasons of this process. And so I decided today my sermon is going to be a little bit different than normal. These are my three areas, the three areas of this cycle. And so we're going to, instead of coming through separate points, we're going to walk through the story together and see how we see them, what area of the cycle they are in. But as we do this, we'll also see that as the Israelites were tempted over and over, it's evident that they get drawn deeper and deeper into sin, that there's not just like this consistent level of sin. They, they struggle to go deeper and deeper. And I think it's like that snowball effect. You know, it starts going down the hill. You think, I'm not doing too bad. And it catches speed and it gets worse and worse. And, and you're in so hard. It's like you're ensnared in sin. And that's what the children of Israel do. And so we're going to see how there's a snowball effect to walking in, in. If you give in to temptation and you're walking in sin, that it starts to overtake you. And at the end of our time together today, I hope that we will all recognize the devastating effects of sin that ensnares us and that we will seek to exhibit faithfulness when we are confronted with temptation. What starts as a simple temptation leads to the sin of a slippery slope, and it takes you deeper and deeper. On our own, we can't get out of it, but God is the one who brings deliverance, and if we rely on him, then we can overcome. So when we're tempted, let's turn to God for him to help us walk in faithfulness. Temptation starts small. With the children of Israel, we first see this lack of faith. It's just, it's just a lack of faith. That's not a sin. That's not bad. It's, it's okay to, to lack faith. Except God told them exactly what they were supposed to do. So remember, I was so proud of them in Judges chapter 1, verse 1. They were seeking God's direction. This is awesome. I was so excited. 
Well, let's see what happens. How do they respond when he gives them direction? Judges 1, verse 2 and 3. The Lord said to Judah, Judah shall go up, or the Lord said, sorry, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hand. Okay, Judah, you're the one supposed to go. So let's see, what does Judah immediately do? Judah said to Simeon, his brother, come with me into the territory allotted to me that we may fight against the Canaanites. And I likewise will go with you to the territory allotted to you. So Simeon went with him. Well, into whose hand did God say he was going to deliver this land? Was it Judah and Simeon? It was not. It was Judah. The military might doesn't matter. They were supposed to follow what God said. God is the one who would bring the victory. You know, Judah was the biggest of the tribes. Simeon, the weakest, the smallest. Why did Judah want his blood brother to come with him and help him in there? It's like he needed the presence of his brother to support him. Rather than saying it, God is going to deliver me into this land and walking in what God told him to do. It demonstrates a lack of faith in God's assurance that the victory is theirs. They didn't need further human assistance because God was on their side. How many times do we think, I know God can do it, but it'd be so much better if I had somebody else with me. I just feel, feel a little bit stronger with someone standing beside me and helping me out. Here, God had said, I will deliver them into the hands of Judah. And modifying the instructions here might not seem like a huge sin, but this lack of faith is a, de- is a sign of moral deterioration that leads to further decline and giving in to temptation. And very quickly, we see further decline as they begin to compromise. They start behaving in the way of the Canaanites, and they go from lack of faith to this place of compromise. In Judges 1, verse 6 and 7, Adoni Bezek fled, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adoni Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps from under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. This is compromise. This Canaanite king, he's a brutal tyrant. He cut off thumbs and, or, yeah, thumbs and toes, right? This was not what God wanted his people to be doing. Why were the Israelites treating this king in the same manner that he treated those who were under him? They should be living to a higher standard, but they compromise and act similarly to this godless king whom they are going to overtake. It's interesting that this king, who's a pagan, actually acknowledges and recognizes that God has brought judgment on him in a right way. But what's worse is that the children of Israel don't recognize that without God's grace, they deserve the same judgment. God's grace is what spares them from receiving the judgment they deserve. And as we move on this, in the story, we see further compromise as, by Caleb, who seeks victory in human strength. In chapter 1, verse 12 to 13, Caleb said, He who attacks Kiriath Sefer and captures it, I will give him Aksa, my daughter, for a wife. That's not really a... Great thing. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, captured it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, for a wife. Now, if you remember Caleb, Caleb showed great faith. Remember when they were seeking out the promised land, there were spies? Caleb was one who had faith. Somehow he turned into a lack of faith, and now he's turned to compromise. Remember not that long ago they inquired of the Lord what they should do? Why did Caleb not inquire of the Lord? What what do you want me to do to win this battle? In his own strength, he thought, I need to, to offer my daughter. He thought he needed to incentivize the, the, the army, the military, to win the battle. It's shameful to think this, this army, they would try to win on their own because you always want to win. I mean, who fights to lose, right? Why did they need an extra incentive? It also shows that he thought even his own family was expendable because victory was that important to him. God wanted to give Caleb this land in his power, but in compromise, Caleb thought he needed to do it in his own strength. 
In a little while, we're going to see another Israelite, Jephthah, who takes it even further in showing this kind of compromise. Caleb's actions are so disgusting that he would offer his, his daughter here to, in order to get victory. And so we think, where are we at in this cycle of disobedience, discipline, and deliverance? Where are we at? We're still in disobedience, aren't we? And we're going to see further compromise along with perhaps some discipline coming next. As we look at Judges 1 verse 19. The Lord was with Judah and he took possession of the hill country. That's good. However, listen to the next part. But he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain because they had some iron chariots. I mean, God is on his side. Why does iron chariots matter, right? This is because of God's discipline upon them that they're not able to drive out this people because of iron chariots. I mean, we have seen what God has done, right? God was able to bring the water over all of the military that was coming after the Israelites when they fled Egypt. God was able to swallow them all up. God was able to bring down the walls of Jericho. Why do these guys think a few iron chariots should stand in the way of the Lord God bringing deliverance? These iron chariots are not too difficult for God. In fact, Joshua had told Ephraim and Manasseh in Joshua 17, 18, but the hill country shall be yours. For though it is a forest, you shall clear it and possess it to its farthest borders. For you shall drive out the chariots. Why? How? Though they have chariots of iron and though they are strong. Did you get that? You shall drive out the Canaanites, though they have chariots of iron and though they are strong. These are not able to drive out the chariots of iron because they're operating in their own strength. And God's in his discipline, leaves them to their own devices. Over and over in the next several verses, we see that Israel becomes comfortable with the foreign godless nations and allows them to dwell amongst them. I'm going to look at, there's six different verses here. Let's just read the beginning part of it. Judges 1.27 says, Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants. Verse 29 says, Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants. 31 says, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants. You getting a common theme here? 33, Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants. All of these tribes, they're living in compromise. After walking in compromise for some time, though, they spiral further and further down into sin. And I would say now they're living in outright rebellion. Instead of driving out the godless people in direct defiance of what God has commanded them, the Israelites live amongst them. And we all know what that means as the Israelites live among the Canaanites and these people who are godless. They're going to be tempted to become just like them. In Judges 2, verses 1 to 3, it says, Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochim. And he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Do you get that? God says, I will never break my covenant with you. This is God's mercy. He's not going to break his covenant. But he has a further stipulation. He says, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. And is that it? That's the end of that verse. You shall break down their altars. So we know that God has this command for them. He says, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare for you. Not only did they sin by allowing the Canaanites to stay as opposed to what Yahweh had commanded them, but they made covenants with these wicked people, and they chose to worship their gods as well. And so we see that God has to bring discipline upon them. Discipline is necessary. And the punishment here is that this land that was supposed to be theirs alone will be shared with godless people. And they're going to have to deal with all the problems and difficulties that come along with that. 
After these acts of disobedience, we come now to this verse that is the start of our second introduction. And this is where we return to Joshua being alive and declaring in verse 7, the people of the Lord served, uh, the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. So we're reminded of their deliverer, Joshua, and how he impacted them faithfully, helping them to worship God. Even after his death, they were faithful. But again, we know that that was part of the cycle. They were in deliverance. Joshua was their deliverer. But once the people forgot Joshua, they come back to the beginning of the cycle, and we see in verses 11 and 13 of chapter 2, all the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them, and they bowed down to them. But get this, they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. The Israelites didn't naively commit these sins. They explicitly broke their covenant with God and walked away from him to serve false gods. This was an act of defiance and rebellion. What started as a simple lack of faith as Judah asked Simeon to come along to help him conquer their territory, they moved into compromise by allowing the Canaanites to live there. And now it's turned to full-out rebellion as they turn away from the Almighty God to serve other gods. Is sin a slippery slope? Absolutely. And while God is slow to anger, there comes a point when his judgment will be held no longer. He disciplines them by allowing them to be oppressed by their enemies. In verses 14 and 15, it says, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to their plunderers. to to the plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm. Wow. The hand of the Lord was against them for harm. Anybody want to be in that place? I don't think so. As the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress... What an awful place to be. That's what happens when we live in sin, when we live in compromise and turn to rebellion against the Lord God. This is hard to read. We see this tension here that the Lord is against them for harm. It's hard for us to understand a merciful and just God who turns against his people. Yet rather than seeing his mercy, we we do see We do see his mercy. We see his love exhibited here in judgment even. God's love is at work even in judgment. Though his judgment does bring them to a place of difficulty where they're crying out. He loves them. He wants them to recognize that they need him. They need to come to a place of acknowledging that they can't live this way. And it is as they are disciplined that they will call out to him so that he can bring them deliverance. God wants to bring them back to himself. So even his act of judgment is done in love. Interestingly, in the next verses, we don't see them cry out to the Lord. But we do see God's mercy and his heart to save them. In Judges 2.16, it says, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. And this is our memory verse today, so I'm going to ask you all to read this verse with me. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. God is so merciful. Did they deserve this? They hadn't even cried out to the Lord here. And he sends them a deliverer. But how do they respond? We see in the next verses, they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and saved the judge and saved them from the hand of their enemy all the days of the judge. 
For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But... Whenever the judge died, they turned their back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them, and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. This section demonstrates this full cycle. They disobey, God brings judgment and and discipline, and then God delivers them, and immediately they go right back into disobedience. And each generation is progressively getting worse. Though God would bring them a deliverer, they would not listen to this judge, this deliverer who was there to help them. And God in his mercy continues to send them deliverers. However, the effectiveness of the judge is based on the character of the judge. And sadly, we see that as the the sin gets deeper and deeper with the children of Israel, the judges are following the same pattern and falling into sin. I want to just take a couple moments to go through some of the judges that are going to be coming in this book. We're going to look at six main judges very quickly, and we'll see how they follow the same spiral downward into sin. We start with a good and godly judge, Othniel. He's basically the perfect deliverer. The spirit of the Lord is upon him. Judges 3.10 says, the spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to the Lord, and the Lord gave him Cushan Rishathane king of Mesopotamia, into his hand, and his hand prevailed over Cush and Rishathaim. Paired with Othniel, we see Uhud, Ehud, sorry, who is also godly and willing to fight against the wicked king of Eglon. Once again, the people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and were oppressed by this king of Eglon, Eglon but God sent Ehud to deliver them. Do you see a pattern again? The people are wicked. They call upon the Lord, and in his mercy, he sends them a deliverer. But sadly, they don't learn, and time and time again, we read this verse. If you take a look at this next verse on the screen, Judges 2, 2, 11, 3, 7, 3, 12, 4, 1, 6, 1, 10, 6, and 13, 1. They all say the same thing, and this is before each judge is sent. And what does it say? It says, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Every time. Look at how many verses. The people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and God brings them a deliverer. And then again, the people did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Well, those first two judges were fairly righteous. Then we see a decline. First we see Barak, who echoes Judah with a lack of faith. At the beginning of Judges 1, where Judah asked Simeon to come with him, well, now Barak, who is called to go forth for victory, he demands that Deborah go alongside of him. In Judges 4, 8, Barak says, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I will not go. He needs Deborah, a woman. You know, Judah needed Simeon, the least of the tribes. Barak needs Deborah, a woman, to come alongside him and give him the strength to stand up and do what God told him to do. Then we see another judge, Gideon, who also shows a lack of faith and continues going into compromise as well. He's always needing reassurance, you know, like, I need God, like, do this to show me. God, put the do here or whatnot. He was supposed to deliver Israel, but erroneously he leads them into apostasy. He made an ephod that was supposed to point to God, but instead became an idol that the people worshipped. In Judges 8.27 it says, And Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city, in in Ophrah. And all Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. You see this downward spiral? This is beginning of greater compromise as we look at the next judge who is Jephthah. I mentioned earlier Caleb who offered his daughter Aksa to the one who would win. Well, here we see an even worse declaration of this. Jephthah wants to see victory so bad that he says in Judges 11.31 that he will sacrifice the next thing that walks through the door to greet him. Well, did he think an animal was going to open the door itself? Obviously, a person was going to walk through the door. He had to know it's his own home. It would likely be his child. God does not condone human sacrifice. God would not be pleased with him sacrificing his daughter. But as he achieves victory, what does he do? He goes ahead and sacrifices his own daughter. 
This is compromise and defiance, rebellion. The final judge we're going to look at is Samson, another judge who God used to deliver Israel. But by his own words and actions, he doesn't even seem to know that God is different from the gods of his enemies. He continually joins himself with this Philistine woman woman named Delilah. And he's not interested in following God's plan that he would stay within his own tribe. In Judges 14, 3, his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among all our people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And listen to Samson's reply. Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. Whose eyes? Should it be that he's right? It should not be his own eyes. It should be God's eyes, right? And the people did evil in the sight of the Lord, right? So focused on what is right in my own eyes. What do I want? I want this. This is just a quick outline of the judges, but it shows how their decline aligns with the deterioration of the people of Israel. Pastor Jonathan will be looking further into these judges in Bible studies, but we see that there's a lack of faith that leads to a pattern of compromise, and eventually there's outright rebellion. And twice we see, and there's actually two other times in Scripture that are very similar to this, but Judges 17.6 and 21.5 both say the same thing. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did did what was right in his own eyes. What happens when we do what's right in our own eyes? Everybody's doing their own thing. There's no standard of righteousness. There's no standard of living the way that God wants you to live. And so, of course, as they're doing what's right in their own eyes, they're walking in wickedness. They're becoming further and further entrenched in evil. And so God must bring about judgment. And in Judges 2, verse 20 to 23, it says, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers, they have not obeyed my voice. I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left the nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua." God says he will no longer drive out this nation. Remember, God's plan was to supernaturally give the children of Israel this land. It was to all be theirs. There were not supposed to be any other people living in it. But since they continually try to do it in their own strength, he's going to pause his work on their behalf and let them really do it on their own. This verse sounds familiar. We already talked about this a little bit, didn't we? Because it's a replica of Judges 2, verse 3, where it says, So so now I say I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare for you. We know that as they walk in this way, that their children are starting to intermingle with the children of those who are from the other nationalities. Children of wickedness. They start to cohabitate. They start to marry, and they start to serve their gods. And I have to tell you, as a parent, one of the things that I think is the hardest trial would would be the hardest trial would be to watch your child walk away from the faith that you hold so dear. This generation has chosen to model that for their children, and it should be no surprise that then their children are going to walk away. Their children are going to intermarry with the other tribes, with the other, other, other nations. As a parent whose heart is for my kids to serve the Lord, I know that God's heart as a parent is also that he would see the children of Israel serve him, that he would see each one of us living in a way that serves him. He's heartbroken when his children turn aside and walk away. When people turn their hearts from God, it doesn't only affect themselves, but it affects generations to come. Though our cycle started with a simple lack of faith, and moved into a place of compromise, now we see that they have turned their hearts to full rebellion, giving themselves over to their own desires. This section seems to end in a place of desolation. The Lord is removing his hands from helping them and allowing them to live in the consequences of their own actions. And hopefully this helps us to recognize the devastating effects that sin has as it so easily entangles us. 
The snowball effect may not look the same for everyone. The lines might be blurred. We might think, you know what, I'm just a little lack of faith. I'm not doing too badly. Then you start to compromise. You think, well, I'm not as bad as the other person who's full-on rebelling against God. But you know what? We're not supposed to compare ourselves to those in the pew next to us, to those who sit on the bus when we go to work. We have a standard of, to live to, and that is the standard of Christ. So we need to break this cycle in our lives in order to walk in repentance. How can we be faithful when confronted with temptation? The answer is that we need to call out to the Lord because he will deliver us. And as he delivers us, he wants us to walk in health and wholeness with his spirit upon us. We can live in a place of victory, having been delivered instead of returning to that place of disobedience. Though our text ends with them being disciplined for their disobedience, once again we know that a deliverer is being prepared and that the first one is that godly judge Othniel, who we just mentioned quickly, and that they will, he will bring them to a place of deliverance. But sadly for them, the cycle will continue, and we see that disobedience is followed by discipline, and then God brings deliverance. For us, I would encourage you that we can accept his work as a great deliverer. Jesus Christ is the greatest deliverer there ever was. And he gives us the grace and mercy so that we can walk in a way that we don't go back into the cycle of disobedience. Yes, disobedience is something that's easy to fall into. We are human. But God is on our side. God wants us to walk in, and triumph over it. And remember, mercy triumphs over judgment. And God desires that all of us would walk in mercy. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. If you are in a state of disobedience today, you can make things right with God. And I want to give you an opportunity to call out to him, to ask that he would deliver you. You can confess your sin and pray to him to bring you deliverance from your situation. And so let's bow our heads at this time. And if any here are living in that place of disobedience, no matter what it might be in your life, if you've never committed your life to Christ, or maybe you've committed your life to Christ, but you're not walking in the way that he has called you, I want you to just take a moment to check your own heart right now and reflect on where you're at in that cycle. Are you living in a place of disobedience? Are you living under discipline right now? You're just praying and crying out to God for deliverance. But we want to give you a time to just check your heart, commune with God, and let him know that you want to live in a place of deliverance, a place of peace with him where you can live right and holy walking in his way. If you want us to pray for you to receive deliverance this morning, you can raise your hand. God is working on our hearts, and he knows the situations that we face. Amen, I see those hands. God wants to bring us out from this cycle that we would not live in disobedience, but that we would seek to honor him in all our ways. I see those hands. God bless you. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you praise that you are such a good and faithful God, that you love your children. Even your acts of judgment are done in love so that they will turn us back to you so that we can come to a place of forgiveness so that our eternity can be with you, Lord. I pray that you would help us not to walk in a path of disobedience, not to walk in this cycle that we would continually go back and do what is evil in your sight but that, God, you would find us faithful, that when temptation comes knocking, we would say, no, we, we rely on our God for strength to, to turn away from it and to walk in righteousness, to walk in holiness, to be set apart from the way of this world, to be set apart from the nations that might be amongst us, but that we don't honor their gods, we honor the one true God. And so, Lord, we give you praise this morning that you are able to find us faithful, you are able to help us, your spirit is upon us, to be our helper. And so we thank you for the Holy Spirit this morning who works in our lives and, and helps our conscience to, to know that we need to walk in righteousness. We know what sin is and we know we don't want to walk there. So God, I pray you'd work in our hearts and help us to honor you in everything we say and do, that you will find us faithful and we will be faithful to you for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. To conclude our service, we're going to sing, Oh, come all ye faithful. And I trust that's all of us today, that we would be counted amongst the faithful. Let's stand together as we sing this final uh, Christmas carol hymn. that that will be our heart's cry, that we will adore him this Christmas season. I'm going to call Hunter to come and close our service with a word of prayer and uh, bless the young adults as they go their way for their uh, lunch and Bible study or devotion. Awesome. Thank you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Uh, well, Father God, we, just, we do thank you for your mercy. We thank you that even though we, we do live in a state of rebellion, that it is your, your kindness that draws us to repentance and that everything that you, you do it is for our love, and even though uh, it may be painful, Lord, it always ends up that we come to you, and that is worth all of it, Lord. So, Lord, we just thank you. I pray that uh, we would all be blessed as we go, that the young adults would have a good time of fellowship, and that you would just be in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen.